Jonathan here. What's the big scoop and who's asking? Why, it's none other than Sammy Kablami Noland, and boy, do I got a story for you. Let's hear it. Okay, we're doing a big cover spread on His Girl Friday. A real ticket, that one. Nah, come on, Kablami Sammy. It's just Sammy. I don't think we need to be covering the funny pictures, do we? Our audience wants the real deal steal. I'm talking drama, suspense, and maybe even romance. Now, Jonathan, I know you've got your doubts, and by Roosevelt, I got them too, but the people voted. They voted. They voted. And the picture they want is a funny picture, and that funny picture they're picturing for us is His Girl Friday. The Howard Hawks picture. The very same. Well, I'll be. You'll be writing up the story is what you'll be. Now, hold on, Kablammy Sammy, or whatever your name. I don't have time to write your stories. Not anymore. I'm getting married next April. Until then, I'm not allowed to leave my home. Not for nothing. Not even the newspaper business. Jonathan, I want results, not excuses. Now call up that ace reporter of ours. Ace? No, the other one. Will Tyler. That's him. We got him on retainer. Ah, uh, hold on. I'll give him a call. Hello? Will. Will Tyler. Uh, John? Oh, good, it's you. We need you on a new story right away. Post haste. ASAP. Why are you talking like that? Like what? Oh. Will, I don't have time for your fun and games. We're covering his girl Friday for the Extra Milestone Gazette. Oh. Yeah, I saw that. Good. Now I need you to write up a cover spread, and this is a straight order from Kablammy Sammy, so no screwing around. You mean Sam? You have until Thursday. I thought you said Friday. His girl Friday. So by Friday. Hello and welcome to The Extra Milestone, your escape from the horrors of reality and the spinoff series of the Cinemaholics podcast, where every month we celebrate a noteworthy film anniversary. These are the classic films that we believe went the extra mile in their filmmaking, making them as relevant today as they were yesterday and are therefore extra milestones. I am your host once again, taking over the reins of the show. It's your old pal, Sam Noland. Uh, and with me, as always, is uh, the uh, the host of the main show and just all around swell fella, John Negroni. How's it going, John? Did you say escape from the Cinemaholics main show? Uh, I said no such Typical thing. Typical Kablammy Sammy. Barking orders. Can't believe it. <laughs> Well, I know I know someone's feeling a little bitter, but hey, it's it's, uh, it's one of many things in the air right now. And also with us, joining us yet again on the extra milestone is uh, our good, good, good friend Will Ashton. Will, how are you? Pretty good. I mean, it's been a little bit. I don't think I've been on a extra milestone in like two, three, maybe four months. Yeah, it's it's been since uh, since Ed Wood, right? Which was, yeah, uh, October. Wow. Yeah, that's right. You play so your cards been, right, that'll go even longer. Yeah. <laughs> Granted, we've been we've been on a bit of a delay, so it's been not quite as long as it sounds. But regardless, it is good to it's good to have you back on the extra. Yeah, it's good to be here. Well, welcome. Yeah, I got a little bit more extra time on my hands in light of recent events. So um, it, it's it's funny able... how that works. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, it's uh. Well, regardless, we're still here. We're not going anywhere. This this show, uh, th- this show at least, will go on, and I'm glad that it is. Uh, it's it's time for another extra milestone. Are you t- are you excited, John and Will? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> not excited. Not ex- not I'm as only, excited for this one. L- listen, I'm only here if- because my mom said I have to have more social interactions. Well, this is this is what passes for social interactions in this yeah. day and age. Um, we end up in a quarantine together, and now we're just talking talking movies. That's correct. talking girls. Well, yeah, girls. <laughs> yes, yes. I see what you did there, John. I do see what you did there. Uh, yeah, this is a uh, this this is our January extra milestone. Uh, boy, do I miss January right about now! But we're catching up, and we're almost there. Uh, we're almost to the present, and. Uh, I'm not. I, I'm not looking forward to the actual present, but in terms of this show, I'm excited that we are here together, gentlemen. We're talking about a film this month, but would you like to know what we didn't decide to talk about? Yeah. What do we What do we miss? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, William. Uh, mm-hmm. Last month we had we had a, a really strange poll because the month of January is kind of notorious for being like the nadir of all cinematic. 
uh, of the entire cinematic landscape. And what I found out in doing research for this month's poll is that that hasn't always been true. It actually started somewhere around 1970, 1975, somewhere in there. Uh, that's when January started, as we know it. Uh, so we actually had some interesting older choices this month, combined with some surprise uh slightly more modern classics that I was surprised to find out were released in January. Among them were, from the year 1940, The Shop Around the Corner, uh, which last month I hadn't seen at the time we did the poll, and I just so happened to have caught up to it uh, for reasons not having to do with Ooh. the extra milestone. It just wandered into my periphery. So that was that was and a you, treat. I really liked you it. Prefer, you prefer You've Got Mail now, right? I have not seen You've Got Mail. I still haven't gotten mm. to that one. Oh, uh, I <laughs> are you trying to put words in my mouth, Jonathan? I'm trying to put movies you, in your head. I well, there are worse. There are worse things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> worse drives that you can it. have. Someone's got it. Yeah, it's. Uh, I watched the shop around the corner and the remake. Not you've got mail, but the other one called In the Good Old Summertime, which I've forgotten most of. So it's not quite good. You're going to want to stick with the OG on this one. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite charming. The one I was pulling to win, or one of them, one of the two, was, uh, George Franju's Eyes Without a Face. Now, John, I know you haven't, you haven't seen this one in a long time. Will, have you ever seen Eyes Without a Face? I'm familiar with the song, but not the movie. <laughs> I, yeah, that was I, the I other thing, Sam, because, uh, I totally forgot to, I neglected to mention it's a Billy Idol song. <laughs> I referenced yeah. Degrassi. Using it as the name of a TV episode before I mention the famous Billy Idol, Bill, or yeah, Bill, is it Billy Idol song? Yeah, it's Billy Idol. Right yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, okay, right. for a second I was like, wait a minute, do I have that wrong too? I nope. mean, I wouldn't be surprised. But yes, uh, it's. I, I didn't mention it either because partially because I'm not especially familiar with the song. But regardless, it is a song. But it's also it's also a movie. It's a really really stylish, really effective horror movie from France, I've, the year 1960. Yeah. I, I mean, really I've heard it's, it. yeah, I was gonna say, I've heard it's one of the scariest movies ever from like cinephiles files. I've heard that much. Yeah, I would say I would, I would put it among that. It's more unsettling than it is scary. If, okay. if you know what I'm saying, like, it's sure. like, it'll just sort of stay with you for a while. Like there, there's one image in particular that I still remember from this movie and it's been the better part of a half a decade since I've seen it. <laughs> so, uh, I recommend checking it out. I believe it's on the criterion channel. It is worth your time. Also yeah, on our it's list, also, was, it's also yeah. one of Mark Kermode's all-time favorite movies. So oh, I didn't know that. There. Take that for what it's worth, which is quite a lot. Uh, uh, also on our list was Robert Altman's *Mash*, the Korea slash Vietnam War satire from 1970. Uh, it's good, and I think that's kind of that's a, that's kind of as far as it goes. I'm not surprised that it didn't get a lot of votes, but I thought you know it's, it did get a no. It was it was one of the front runners. Let's. Let's it's, root for it a little bit. Maybe I'm forgetting the poll, but regardless, it, it was not among the top two or three contenders. Uh, I think oh. I think it was the third highest, maybe next to uh, Before okay. Sunrise or Shop Around the Corner. Yeah. So I should just I, was, I should shut my mouth about the votes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've heard Mash doesn't really hold up too well, so that might have been an interesting discussion. But yeah. I mean, I haven't seen it, so I can't say for certain. It's I, I saw it like two, three years ago. I thought it was fine, but maybe I'd think differently now. Uh, regardless, it's not what we're talking about. Maybe another time. Uh, also on our list was uh, the cult classic, no matter whether or not Will Ashton wants to admit it, uh, <laughs> Tremors, which is uh, the the sandworm movie with Kevin Bacon mm -hmm. and uh, and Reba McIntyre, Michael Gross, among others. So it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, has a has a sizable following. Uh, many of which would went been, to my college, incidentally. Yeah. Uh, would have been the first Reba McIntyre movie we covered on Extra Milestone. <laughs> I guess I'll <laughs> have to hopefully wait. hopefully not the last. <laughs> it would yeah. definitely have to not wait be until the last. Uh, Spies in Disguise uh, turns 10, I guess, to <laughs> break that ground. <laughs> oh, goodness. That's, that day, that'll be a weird day when Spies in Disguise is an extra milestone. Uh, but that is for another time. And our final nominee that didn't win, and we were all kind of shocked at this, uh, Richard Linklater's Before Sunrise didn't win. Like, we thought that was going to be a yeah. runaway. We thought everyone was going to be, like, so so enamored by that. Because it's a, it's one of, it's a it's incredibly acclaimed movie. It's one of the most successful uh, independent films of all time. Spawned a trilogy that's very, very well regarded. 
I thought this was going to win in a landslide, and it came close, but uh, it it just didn't quite get there. Like I know among cinephiles, it's a fairly um you know it's a, like you said it's a favorite and it's well beloved. But like I feel like when I talk to you know just folks that aren't as well tuned to the cinema scene, they're not as familiar with it or don't really know about it. So yeah. I don't know. I mean I don't know how who what our extensive like voting pool is, but I know it's. It seems like it's a movie that may not be as popular as we lead, or re, re, we, we, we're led to believe, but um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know for sure. I mean, that's the thing. I don't exactly know how popular it is, but I know, it's, like you said, it's very well yeah. claimed. You might be right. But even if that's true, I wonder, like, what made the movie that did win supersede that? We may never right. know. That's where my theory comes in. I think it's because the Extra Milestone listeners, they want us to talk about comedies. I, I'm telling like, just look at the last bunch of movies that they voted for. Mm. Ed Wood, Life of Brian, His Girl yeah. Friday Now, Young Frankenstein. Like, we've done, like, a bunch of comedies in a row, and a lot of them have won by a decent margin. So, mm. and mean, even I before that, like, we did a bunch of comedies. I feel like His Girl Friday, though, is a movie that people know about, if they, even if they haven't seen. Like, they've heard of His Girl Friday from either inspiring other films or what have you. But maybe, I, I can yeah. see what you mean. I think that's a, that's a plausible theory that you have. Yeah, maybe so. Well, regardless, that is what happened. Uh, as you know, if you've downloaded this episode, His Girl Friday did, did end up winning. Uh, some other films I want to mention real fast that did not make it onto the poll. Uh, a movie called from the year 1950 called Gun Crazy, which is one of the one of the greatest noirs I've ever seen. Uh, really like really like morally ambiguous and kind of and kind of shady and like really unsettling. Uh, I really like it. Have either of you seen Gun Crazy? No. no, I know Will has seen Guns Akimbo. Sounds yeah, true. Nice. Yeah, I have seen Guns Akimbo. <laughs> no relation, but fair enough. Uh, yeah, I recommend checking it out. I don't know off the top of my head where to find it, but it's around. It's uh, it, it's still still talked about to this day, and for good reason. Uh, another one from the year 1955 from the director of The Passion of Joan of Arc, one of the greatest silent movies of all time, uh, a movie called Ordet, which I've been meaning to get around to for a really long time. I thought this might be a good occasion, but I just didn't think it was, I just didn't think it was well known enough to put it on the poll. But uh, just so everyone knows, that celebrates uh, uh, 65 years. So from Carl Theodore Dreyer, one of the, one of the better filmmakers, whoever lived, I say. Uh, same goes for uh, Diabolique, from the director of The Wages of Fear, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, Diabolique, you may know from the weird, candid reference Anna Kendrick made to it in the movie A Simple Favor, which really like kind of blew my mind. It came completely out of the blue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, oh, okay, that's Paul Feig for you, I guess. Uh, so that if that means anything to you, uh, you're going to want to check that out. Uh, we mentioned it briefly last month, but uh, it's... It, the, the context around this has changed slightly. Uh, what many consider to be kind of the, kind of the er example of the, of a really good James Bond movie, Goldfinger, was released in the U.S. Oh. in January 1965. That's my favorite Bond film. Yeah, same here. I, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's still the best one. And, uh, the, the, the status of 007 is kind of, has been, has been radically shooken up at the moment. So I thought uh -huh. maybe, it was worth mentioning. Uh, another movie that is not as talked about, but I think is really quite good. Uh, I, I wrote an article about this movie last year for the Criterion Movie of the Week series, which is uh, To Sleep With Anger, directed by, uh, oh gosh, what was the name? Charles of Burnett. Uh, Char Charles Burnett. Yeah, I, couldn't, I was blanking there for a second. Uh, starring Danny Glover. It's, it's a really intense kind of a movie that kind of appears to be a melodrama at first but uh you realize there's a lot more going on to it than just than just broad uh dramatic strokes it's really really good so i recommend checking that out I, that one is on the criterion channel as well as it should be and the last movie that probably by all accounts probably should have made it onto the poll just because of how uh significant it is and everything but there are there there are a couple of can of worms involved with it that i just i ultimately decided against it i talked to john about this it is the usual suspects uh there is not only is uh is kevin spacey involved but brian singer is also involved it would be a lot of just, just a lot of unsavory context to uh 
to have to talk about. Plus, it's been talked about quite a bit in the past 25 years now. Uh, it did premiere in January of 1995. It did not go wide until August. We might discuss it again when that time comes. But thought it was worth mentioning that The Usual Suspects is 25 years old. And I'll say it, regardless of all the stuff, it's still pretty damn good, all things considered. It's, I'd it's, say a, it, it's a very impressive movie. It probably would have made the polls if this were like the spring of 2017, probably. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. No, yeah, we we can't deny that that uh, that hindsight has not has not been particularly kind to the stuff surrounding the movie, uh, if not the movie itself. But regardless, that is the usual suspects. A quarter of a century old. Uh, it's it's older than I am, and somehow I feel old thinking that. So very strange. Uh, that was that was January. That was everything we didn't select. What we did select, as we've alluded to before, is. Howard Hawks' 1940 screwball comedy, His Girl Friday, celebrated its 80th birthday uh, in the month of January this year, 2020. It is uh, going by that. It is our first milestone of the year 2020. Um, Finally. In terms, of, in terms of what we're celebrating. Yeah, it's uh, we, we're, yeah. we're significantly behind, so we've already done at least one or two the calendar year. But in terms I appreciate, of, though, our time traveling. And uh, yes. going back to a simpler time, <laughs> January yeah. 2020. Oh my! Goodness. We didn't know Remember what we had. January. Remember when January and February were just the worst? We could we could go outside. <laughs> I and... long for that now. Yeah. Oh well, it's uh, it's uh, it'll be all right. I hope. I hope. I really hope everything will be all right. Uh, well, we're warming ourselves up with some good old classic movies from the 1940s. Our first. That's right. 1940s milestone so yeah that's true i didn't even realize that we we've done the 30s we've done a couple of 50s movies uh i think we've done we've done done every every, decade decade. except this is yeah this is the last one um we'd have to go back to the 20s and the teens Uh uh-huh which which uh, not to not to tip my hand too much there is a film from the 1920s on this on this month's poll so that it might be the time we might the jazz singer no, it's not the jazz singer, John. <laughs> <laughs> not, mathematically, that wouldn't even make sense. Plus, if even if it yeah. were appropriate, <laughs> it's I would like not. It's like 27, I 28 or whatever. It was 27. Yeah, I'm, mm. we're not going to put the jazz singer on a poll <laughs> if that time ever comes. Uh, in the same way that we're not going to put Birth of a Nation on a poll. We, we might yeah. mention them, but it's not going on the poll. Because I never would not want to tempt never. I'm not accusing the listeners of anything. <laughs> I do not want to tempt them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not, let's not put that... Uh... <laughs> let's not dangle that bait in front of uh our listeners yeah yeah uh and and uh and and john as you mentioned getting back to his girl friday this is i, I thought it was our third comedy in a, in a row but i guess if you want to if you want to be lenient uh ed wood is by all intents and purposes it is a comedy so this would be our yep. fourth comedy in a yeah. row that we've done mm-hmm. i guess and you know what honestly thinking about it i can see why i can see why heavy drama is not necessarily the thing that uh that that many individuals might be clamoring for at a time like this so i suppose yeah. it's I mean, only fair you could argue that all the movies we've done are comedies if you have a dark sense of humor i guess maybe so I'm just yeah i'm just kidding Easy seven Rider samurai a, do the right thing yeah. 400 blows yeah. <laughs> uh yeah although, although to be clear i am kidding before, around but yeah yeah but well well, well uh uh Given that, uh, before this like kind of run we've been doing, we did do uh, sort of another broad comedy. Our first one ever, I believe, was uh, "It Happened One Night." That's a very comedic movie. So yeah, this is that's not, right. Not completely unprecedented. Uh, so I'm. Excited. I did think a lot about "It Happened One Night" as I was watching um, "His Girl Friday." I don't know if you guys did as well. I did too, for yeah. sure. Hmm, interesting. I'm I'm curious to hear about this because I did not. They're from they are from the same era, so maybe it's something about that. We will get to that, but first. Let's talk about how His Girl Friday came into existence. What do you say? Yeah, well, and then on that note, I know you're going to mention him, but just talking about Extra Milestone in general, we are crossing off another, like, amazing director off our yep. list, as we'll yep. get to, because we've, we've had great directors like Kira Kurosawa, Ilya mm-hmm. Kazan, Spike Francois Lee. Francois Truffaut, yeah. Uh, we, we've really, you know, Ridley Scott... We really have run the gamut of incredible directors, and this is yet another um, milestone in that front, too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very excited to talk about it. Uh, His Girl Friday 
uh, released in 1940, was based on the 1928 Broadway comedy The Front Page, uh, written by uh, Ben Hecht and Charles MacArthur. I might be mispronouncing that first last name. Um, who were who were Chicago reporters initially? They were they were newspapermen, as uh, as may be evident by watching this movie. Um, Charles MacArthur and Ben Hecht, uh, Ben Hecht especially, actually had a really impressively sizable uh, career in the in the film industry in the quote unquote classic era. Uh, I put together a little list of just the screenplays, credited and uncredited, that Ben Hecht worked on. I'm just going to list these titles, uh, some of which you may have heard of. Uh, Monkey Business, Scarface, the original, A Star is Born, also the original, Stagecoach, Wuthering Heights, Gone with the Wind, The Shop Around the Corner, coming up again, Foreign Correspondent, Roxy Hart, Spellbound, Notorious, Rope, Strangers on a Train, The Thing from Another World, A Farewell to Arms, Cleopatra, and the original Casino Royale. And that's that just it? like... That's all? Th- that's, like a, that's like a quarter of the movies that he worked on. It's, uh, it's, it's barely... Well, I'm not impressed. No, you're you're being incredibly facetious, and I don't appreciate it. That's an insane career, uh, uh, and it's the fact that we don't talk about it as much is probably due to the fact that it was just uncredited a lot of the time. Um, a lot of it was just sort of advisory work, like saying like, "Hey, change this line here, and maybe give this character a little clearer motivation." Like not directly punching up the actual words of the script, but just sort of giving giving pointers and stuff but regardless that's really that's that's really quite impressive when you think about it that one person was able to contribute so much to the cinematic landscape whether or not it holds up today which i haven't seen all of those so i couldn't say for 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 all of them but uh it's impressive nonetheless the front page was a uh really frantic uh fast-paced as is the movie itself uh story about news reporters who end up uh hiding a convicted murderer who's set to be who's set to be executed in like a roll top desk and that's the climax of his girl friday so that that was kind of the entire play was just in that one single room so uh they real howard hawks who at the time had uh had just had just uh come off a little bit of a run with uh uh, bringing up baby and only angels have have wings and the original Scarface, which uh, which uh, he directed. Not everyone knows that um, he was working on only angels had wings, and he said, "I want to I want to adapt this uh, this play, the front page, which had already been made into a movie in 1931, directed by Lewis Milestone." I did not get a chance to see it. I know the two of you were talking about watching it. Did you ever get around to that? I did. Will Ashton yep. was too busy playing baseball with his friends <laughs> instead of coming with me to, yeah. you know, to watch this really cool movie. So, yeah, I mean, we almost watched it together, but then we were tempted <laughs> by a certain movie. <laughs> What's this? We? Um, yeah, you might. It, uh, it will soon be a, an extra milestone film. So I don't know if I should oh, divulge it, but um, it, 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 I think, warranted our full attention. Yeah, L- listener. Since Will has thrown uh. this has thrown this uh, this carrot out into the wind, uh, we were gonna watch the front page remotely together. But then, for whatever reason, Will decided no. Instead, we're gonna watch. I didn't do this. anything. You did. You you. I your said, mouth. hey, would it be funny if we watched 2006's The Legend uh. of Sasquatch with William Hurt and Jonathan okay. Rhys Davies? One minute later, you John are- is pulling it up. <laughs> You are downplaying the peer pressure that you employed, <laughs> nay, demanded. Yeah. I don't remember it that way. I yeah. think you guys are fooling. It was really, really bizarre. Uh, the point is is that we didn't watch the front page, but John did. John, how was it? The front page, in my opinion, is better than His Girl Friday. I like Fascinating. it Fascinating. Fascinating. And this is I the 1931... Yeah, we'll 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 talk about it. But the front, the His Girl Friday does one thing that I do think is pretty inspired with the source material. Uh-huh. Aside from that, I think it's it's a way tighter, more wonderfully written film. Um, personally, yeah. uh, which which is unusual because it's actually longer. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we're we're sort of jumping around a little bit, but doesn't feel uh, longer. Yeah, yeah. It's I was gonna say uh, Howard Hawks was sort of sort of set out to make a 
if not necessarily better movie, to make a faster movie than the front page. Because, as I mentioned before, the dialogue is meant to be really, really snappy and really uh, quickly delivered. Um, and that held true in the front page, the uh, the initial film adaptation. Howard Hawks said, we're going to do that, but we're going to make it even faster. We're going to break the record for the fastest film dialogue, which at the time was held by the front page. Um, which I don't know how they measure that necessarily, like if it's... If it's uh, measured across the entire movie or individual scenes but whatever the case uh he, he ended up doing it and he might have he might have cheated a little bit as i'll mention here in a second um but we'll get to all that later so what happened was that uh howard hawks pitched a, uh the remake of the front page to harry Cohn, the head of columbia pictures who uh i mentioned before in a previous episode i forget which one harry Cohn is the devil himself and that's I, I won't go into any more detail than that but everything every despicable thing you've heard uh takes place in the entertainment industry this this person really perpetuated that in a in a tremendously unsavory way uh that was during the production of only angels have wings and what happened was that they got the they got the uh they got the script, they got the text of the front page. They were doing like a table read or something something of that nature. And uh rather by accident, they had the idea, say, what if we make uh Hildy Johnson, one of the characters in the play, uh who is uh, ready to quit the newspaper business and run off and get married and, and start a, uh, start a family life. What if we made that character a woman? Because, uh, uh, an assistant or a secretary or something like that, uh, who was a woman ended up reading Hildy's part because they didn't have anyone else to do it. Uh, and Howard Hawks kind of said, you know, this actually kind of works better if this character is a woman. Uh, and it ended how, up. How elevating- demeaning is that, by the way? It's like, they accidentally realized, yeah. ugh. Yeah, they they just sort of like they were they were completely content with having literally every yeah. character be a man. We don't uh, have anybody else here to read. The, I guess she could read if she asks nicely. Come on, uh, yeah. No, you're not wrong. It's a uh, it's it's an unsavory time in many ways. Um, but regardless, that is that is how it ended up happening, and what and and uh, what it ended up doing. To to varying degrees, depending on who you ask or when you ask, potentially, is that it kind of it kind of changed the story. Um, some would say elevated. Uh, it made it more than a straightforward comedy. And this is this is the intent. Uh, all this I'm saying is just the intent that I believe they they must have had, which is that it's going to elevate it beyond a straightforward comedy and make it more of a movie about gender dynamics. And if you watch the movie, that becomes clear pretty quickly like this this is a this is not just a movie about uh you know the the shenanigans of the of the newspaper industry which it is yeah kind of well first it, and foremost. it changes the themes of the movie the themes of the front yes. page are that like you owe it to you like your career is more important than your personal life or yeah. like, but to the point where like your career can swallow you whole whereas uh-huh. like this movie is about that but also you know, toxic men are going uh-huh. to like always win you back over. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. Whether or not that was even intentional. And I think as you'll, what you'll find out as we start to talk about the movie is that maybe it wasn't, and maybe this deserves a second look. Uh, it's, 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 it's a fascinating story, uh, regardless of sort of the, sort of the, the, you know, the things it may have spawned, well, the unsavory I'll, things. I'll cut to the chase. And, and my personal reading of this film is that Howard Hawks is criticizing the idea of uh, toxic men winning women back over and like he's making light of it, but I don't think he's on the side of like, this is how people should live their lives. But I think he is saying that there's something sort of mundane about domestic life and that you'll never truly be fulfilled just in general. I think he's Uh a very cynical person, honestly, and you just have to sort of go with whatever makes you happy in the short term and just live with the fact that nothing will ever truly last. You're always going to be let down by the people around you, no matter what. Why am I depressed? <laughs> you, you, no, you're not wrong at all. For for such a, for such a zippy, exciting, uh, funny movie, I'll say it. I laugh quite a bit during it. Um, it's got this dark underbelly that I did not realize the first time I watched this and was like, yeah, there's a lot of really uh 
really depressing stuff just yeah. under the surface of this movie. And that's uh, what works about it. That's what makes the zippiness easier to appreciate, I think. Yeah. It's not just it's not just it's not just goofiness running abound on the screen. At least not at least not in a vacuum. Yeah, I'd say with the exception of one or two scenes, <laughs> personally. Yeah. yeah, maybe so. We will we will get to that. Uh so uh Harry Cohn approved, said, go for it, bought the rights in I want to say January of uh of uh either 1939 or 1940 no it was it was a uh, 1939 and yeah. said uh go for it write the script and so ben hecht and charles MacArthur, the original uh playwrights they were not available at the time so howard hawks hired charles Lederer to make uh changes to the script to go along with that uh, alteration that they had made. Charles Lederer, if you don't recognize the name uh was a was a somewhat prolific uh prolific screenwriter in in that same era not quite to the level of ben hecht but some of the some of the uh scripts that he worked on among others were yeah inc- they were incidentally clo- they were close yeah. friends just to be clear yeah yeah for sure uh and, and uh and they actually worked together a couple of times charles leader worked on the front page the original so he had dealt with this material before so it makes sense that yeah. he was the one howard hawks went after uh he also worked on the lady from shanghai orson welles's movie uh, and uh, a movie that Howard Hawks didn't direct, despite uh, that it's a common misconception, but did produce and was involved in heavily, The Thing from Another World, which John Carpenter remade 30 some odd years later. Uh, and also a movie that I, I does not get talked about enough. I think it's quite good. The original Rat Pack Ocean's, Ocean's Eleven. 11. Uh, I was wondering if you could bring that. that up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's that movie's quite good. That came out in 1960. So we might be mentioning it sometime uh, later on this year. Charles Leder made those changes, um, sort of fleshed out the narrative beyond just the one room Broadway setting that that many of us are familiar with uh, and included various other locations, a lot more incident and, of course, altered the dialogue to make the uh, characters stand out more uh, following the changes that had been made. Um, Howard Hawks also hired uh, another screenwriter named Maury Reiskind to sort of fine-tune the changes that Charles Leder had made. Uh, Maury Reiskind, another prolific screenwriter, had worked with the Marx Brothers a, a half dozen or so times before his Girl Friday, so had a lot of experience in that really uh, zippy, tight comedy. Uh, so it was a good choice. Also worked on had t- had two Oscar nominations previously for My Man Godfrey and Stage Door. So no no slouch in the 1930s screenwriting uh, uh, milieu. So yeah, had a lot of I think had a probably, lot of good talent working on this. Yeah, I think fans of Mark Smothers will probably be Animal Crackers. Um, yeah, probably the big one. That uh-huh. and Night at the Opera. Yeah, I would throw in Duck Soup as well. But they're they're many, well, he many no, these are the films that he did. He didn't work on Duck Soup as far as oh I know. right. I thought I thought you were saying. Uh, oh yeah, the... <laughs> no, not just not just Marx Brothers in general, but yeah, yeah, yeah. just uh, Animal Crackers and Night at the Opera were two of the big ones he did. And I think he did others, but yeah, yeah, the first he did three or four movie. others. And and this movie ha- does have that kind of Marx Brothers pace to it, uh, it which which you might recognize immediately. Um, all this went down this the, the entire writing process. Um, it amounted to over 50 percent of the front page the play being rewritten from the original which is which is ironic because howard hawks before this all started had stated that the front page had quote the finest modern dialogue that had been written but i'm gonna change half of it so it really there there's there's a certain amount of hubris involved in this you kind of have to right because if you gender swapping the movie changed a lot of the movie like yeah. I think a lot of the a lot of the dialogue he must have changed had to have uh-huh. been between like Hildy Johnson and the reporters, for example, and um, all everything with Bruce Baldwin and like the mother character. And it's like once you change the gender, I don't know. Like I think it makes sense. I, I don't I don't look at it as him sort of being cheeky, even though that's probably oh, no. part of it. That that's not what I was saying. I I might have used the wrong uh, terminology there. I'm, uh, I'm not it's sorry. Kind, I'm not putting words in fun. your mouth. I've heard that from people before, and I, that's just my opinion. And fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. Yeah, no, I get, I totally see where it's coming from. I just think it's kind of funny that uh, these two these two acts sort of contradict each other a little bit, but with good cause. Uh, the script was finished. It was with with over half of it being changed. The Hayes office, uh, uh, the arbiters of the production code, they approved of everything. And this was funny to me. 
ex they approved of everything except for some illegal behavior of the characters. There's a convicted murder in this movie. I don't know how they get around that. Uh, and this was the one that that I that I found kind of humorous. Derogatory comments towards newsmen. The newspaper industry was going to take it personally, and the Hayes Code said, "No, no, no." Don't don't go after the newspaper industry. Like that was the line they drew. The Hayes Code's really well, weird. I mean, that kind of makes sense because if they get bad press, then the movie's not going to do well. I of don't course. know if that's your logic, but I mean, it's, that's it might have been thinking. It's it's it just comes across as being as as being kind of thin skinned No, I get what uh, you're saying. Yeah, it's like don't episode. accept them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like anybody but them. Yeah, it's yeah. uh. It, they they took issue with that. It was changed slightly. Uh, evidently, the version we got uh, was a little harsher. So I wonder what that might have looked like. Uh, we may never find out. In yeah, fact, and you know, won't. speaking of which, do you guys think if they remake this movie again, you know what they're going to call it? What's that? Fake news. Hmm. <laughs> well, I was going to say that, um, yes. like, they have that little <laughs> thing in the beginning to seemingly offset any potentially upset journalists at the beginning, like that little, like... This doesn't represent the fine men who do this. So, yeah. yeah. But no like, journalists about, were what, harmed in the making. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um, yeah. what about the journalists who come into the movie like three minutes late? They're getting popcorn and, you know, they come into the movie <laughs> and they're like, wait no, a peanuts, minute. At this point. <laughs> yeah. That's funny because that would happen all the time. They, well, like, hold on. Just, yeah. That's why. And hold that's on. Why we're. <laughs> we're off we're off on a little bit of a tangent here but that's yeah. why if you watch old movies characters will address each other by their first name way more than they would in person and that's because there was no there was no stigma towards walking into a movie late like no one really cared if they missed the beginning and so they would need to be caught up if they just happen to walk in like you could walk in in the last 10 minutes uh, and and but just paying full price just if you feel like killing 10 minutes or something it was very it was very uh it's very fast and loose when it when it came to uh, consuming cinema cinema at least yeah. from the from the bystander perspective so to speak. Uh, so that that's funny to imagine a journalist going in and being like, "I will have absolutely none of this." Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I never yeah. talk like this. I don't hear anybody. <laughs> There's something like that. Yeah. <laughs> we don't call the phones that much. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have like seven phones on a desk at once talking over each other. That's absurd. <laughs> It's uh, more like four or five. I, I don't know. I won't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> Your oh, Jimmy goodness. Stewart leaked in a little bit there. But yeah, I know. We'll yeah, let it slide. I'll have none of this. I never heard. I don't know why he's Southern now. But <laughs> <laughs> Since we're talking about journalists, can I tell you guys something I've never told anybody before? Oh, good. I think I was doing what popcorn. Go, what's up? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to say to all the listeners, to my friend Sam, Will, hey, um, hey. Hilly Johnson, the reporter. Yeah, yep. that's my type. Okay, that's okay. it. That's that's just mean, that's my type. What am I supposed mean, to do with that information, John? <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying are you, you have to do anything. <laughs> I, are you talking about specifically Rosalind Russell as Hilly Johnson? All of the above. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Well, we should mention that John's taken. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes. John's yes. Sorry. Sorry. Engaged. Uh, this is not a proposition. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. However, <laughs> yeah. If you were curious, what my fiance is like, very similar. And okay. uh, I kind of okay. realized that while watching this, I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> not well, that I'm Carrie Grant. <laughs> sure. Not that I could try. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm more Bruce Baldwin, if anything. Uh, <laughs> or sorry, Ralph Bellamy. <laughs> uh, fair enough. I'm curious to ask later on. Uh, if you've had any prior experience with this movie, but we will get to that shortly here. Um, speaking of which, speaking of Rosalind Russell, when it came to the casting of the movie, the script had been completed uh, sometime around uh, the fall of 1939. Cary Grant had worked with uh, Howard Hawks previously in Bringing Up Baby and was sort of reflexively cast. And, he fit, and he's very well cast in this movie, I'll say that. Um, mm -hmm. When it came to casting Hildy, the now female version of Hildy, uh, many actresses were considered before Rosalind Russell, uh, and the story of how they, uh, of how, of like her audition and stuff was, was very funny to me. So they went through, uh, a lot of actresses, all of whom just were not, were either not right for the role or didn't want to do it. Um, to the point where Rosalind Russell was kind of their last choice, 
like the last resort and she kind of knew that like she somehow just could tell by the way that she was approached like oh you couldn't get anyone else could you and so what what she did is that when she met with howard hawks uh she decided i'm gonna go for a little swim right before i do that and i'm gonna go in like com- like in in shambles and like with wet hair and everything just to just to see if he gives a damn and sure enough he was like i'll have none of that uh but was and, and that sort of set the tone as it turns out for uh for how she went about the production of this movie um what she did was that she hired her own separate writer on the side like kind of a ghost writer who said here's my dialogue change it a little bit uh just 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 uh just sharpen it a little bit because um evidently she was not satisfied with the dialogue that had been written and it and it kind of makes sense when you think about it all the all of the writers who worked on the dialogue in this movie were men so you can see how uh she might not uh feel uh uh, uh you know like like she had been done justice in the script uh, so she hired her own writer. I didn't get the name of this writer, but evidently Cary Grant was in on this and every morning would come up to her and say, Hey, what do you got? What do you got today? What are we, what are we working with? What changes? Because Howard Hawks, uh, encouraged a lot of improvisation, a lot of ad libbing, uh, a lot of fourth wall breaking even, which does take place, uh, uh, a couple of times in the movie. Uh, it was a very freewheeling set to the point where they were behind schedule. Like they were a week behind schedule uh when it came to uh production um filming began late september of 1939 they finished up late november and it was released in early january it's it's kind of insane how fast they were able to crank out this movie uh and, and just any movie of that time period like like things could go from conception to release in less than a year uh so it's really it's it's really quite inspirational and it's just so dramatically not a thing anymore uh, at least not in the grand scheme of things. So it's, 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 uh, it's interesting to think about that. Um, the release date was rushed as it turns out. So maybe this was a little bit of an abnormal case. Uh, they had like a preview screening in December, uh, which, which might have qualified it for last month. But regardless, they had a press screening in early January. They premiered it a week later and it went into wide release a week after that. So by, by the middle of January, this thing was, was, nationwide in in cinemas around the nation uh so that is the story of how his girl friday came to be it was released it was a success both critically and financially and here we are 80 years later talking about it with that in mind i want to know and we're going to start with john because now i'm curious john what is your prior experience with howard hawks's his girl friday so this was my first time watching the film in full. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I had seen plenty of this movie. I mean, there's so many famous scenes. I had seen the opening scene where she goes into the office and tells him the, the how she's engaged and all of that. Uh, the reason I had seen that scene before is because uh, I had watched for film uh, school. We had watched that scene as like a, this is how you understand blocking. And this is how you understand dialogue through character action. And so it walked us through the the very subtle notes of how Cary Grant's character is trying to coax her back into his life. And it was it was a fascinating thing. I never got to see the whole movie in full because, I mean, at that time, it wasn't like as widely available. I, I, I couldn't have streamed it and I just didn't have it. So I didn't watch it. Uh, this was back in like, you know, 2010, something like that. Yeah. And so this was a great excuse to finally watch it. It was one of the reasons, too, is like when you first mentioned it, it was on the poll. I was like, oh, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. With, let's see what uh, if uh, Rebecca Black is in this movie. Let's do it. <laughs> OK, that that's what a, what a strange reference to make uh, <laughs> of all so, the, of all the so, Friday references I could have gone after. That yeah. was the one that I chose. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. Now, th- now, this is what I want to know, because. Because Hildy Johnson is in that first scene. Was it at that yeah. point that you knew? Like, oh, ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, no, I think, I think we're watching. Is it hot it in this room, has... guys? Ooh. <laughs> Pull it on the collar. And Ooh, it God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's his girl Friday and I'm in love. There you go. So There you go. Uh, fascinating. And, and, uh, and just out of curiosity, how did, you, uh, how did you view it on this initial viewing, John? What was your method of choice? 
Well, you know, as the listeners know at this point, I am a chartered member of the Criterion Channel. Criterion Channel? Member. What's that? <laughs> that means that I go on the Criterion Channel streaming app, and I can stream all kinds of new releases, like... 400 Blows and Seven Samurai. <laughs> <laughs> the movies we watched together on this very show. I was like, where are you going with this, John? <laughs> oh, gosh. I thought there's, about going there's... through all the films that are on there that have not been chosen by the listeners, but I was like, I'm not going to go with a guilt trip. Let's not do that. Yeah. that's That would be interesting. Incidentally, Before Sunrise in the Criterion Collection. Not sure if it's on the channel, but I have the Blu-ray of it, so... That would have been an interesting way. Yeah, uh, I just Will, had the DVD, like some kind of college student. Some kind of college student, that's right. William, how did you watch, mm-hmm. how and when uh, did you watch His Girl Friday? Was this your first jaunt into the into the world of the 1940s new jaunt? Industry? You're talking to Will. Ha. Uh, I see what you did there. Don't be, don't be cheeky here. This is Will's time to shine. Yeah, I mean, I think similar to John, I had see I hadn't seen scenes from it, but I've seen scenes that are clearly inspired by it or parroting this film in certain ways. I wish sure. I had an example, but I can't really think of anything. But oh, sure. with the exception of um, BoJack Horseman season. Oh six, yeah, <laughs> um, which I think John was gonna mention later, so I kind of stole his fire there. No, no, no. But, go ahead. It's it's a wonderful uh, yeah <laughs> yeah. Um, which was uh, I mean, there's two characters. Well, John will explain later. Um. But yeah, I mean, this, I mean, it had experience with Howard Hawks. Like, I'd seen Bringing Up Baby. It, I think I'd seen one or two of his other films. But, um, yeah. I, yeah, I only really knew about it in the peripheral. Like, I knew its influence. I, I was familiar with the front page of the play. Um, but I wasn't, uh, as familiar with the film. I hadn't seen it. So, this is my first <laughs> experience watching it. I saw it on Tubi. It was actually quite readily available in a way that I wasn't anticipating. Like, it's on YouTube. Yeah. It's, it's on, in the public uh, domain, it's all over the place. Yeah, so I was going to say, it's pretty easy to find if you're looking to watch it and assume you haven't already, dear listener. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you can find it pretty easily, and I found it, and I watched it through Tubi. And, uh, nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, have, I do not have nearly as short of a history with <laughs> as, as either of you with His Girl Friday. Allow me to elaborate. Picture, if you will, August 2015. Little- what a time to be alive. Little, we had little oh yet. gosh, what what nostalgia I have for that time for more reasons than one. Uh, picture, if you will, and I know you might not be able to because not everyone knows what I look like. Little sixteen-year-old Sam Noland. Uh, it's the summer. It's school's about to start. My junior year of high school, and. I'm just really starting to get into this whole movie thing. I'm like, wow, this is really fascinating. There's like an entire history. I wonder, I wonder what is there out there to consume? And it was around that time, and I, I think I even remember the day, August 10th, 2015, I discovered, get this, a little website called Letterboxd. I was like, ooh, what's this? This is like this is like social media for for cinephiles. Count me in. Yeah. Oh I'm, gosh. I'm imagining Sam as Aladdin walking into the cave of wonders. <laughs> Don't touch anything. <laughs> but then you see it in the center. Yes. Your first yes. letterbox review. That's right. I, well, that that was the thing is that I I was like, what am I gonna watch first? I know what I'll do. I'll go onto this list of uh, that I that I just recently discovered. Empire Magazine's top 500 movies of all time. I've mentioned this list many times. Uh, any, uh, all of the, all of the movies that have, that are on that list that we've talked about, I've gone out of my way to mention that because I, rem- I memorized that entire thing, and I still, and I still know it. So you can give me any number. 115. I, 115 is Blazing Saddles. How weird is okay. that? Um, he rode a blazing saddle. <laughs> he, sorry. Yeah. Regardless, uh, I said I'm going to go onto that list. And I didn't. I hadn't. I didn't have the whole thing memorized at that point. I'm going to put him in a random number generator. I'm not even making this up. And whatever comes up first, or, or whatever number comes up that I haven't seen before, that'll be my first review. I and we all know in, what it was. It was Avatar I, 2009. It was Avatar did not had not been released at the time of that list. So, uh, so don't even try to be cheeky here, Jonathan. Uh. I hit generate. The number forty came up. I'm like. What could it be? And there it was, His Girl Friday. I'm and incidentally, at the time, 
Remember, remember these days when Netflix had like classic movies? His Girl Friday was on Netflix in August of 2015. I'm like, bam, that's the one. Now hold I watch on, watch it. Hold yeah. on. His yeah. Girl Friday was number 40. Number 40. Is that the highest on that list that we've talked about? Um. Oh, it can't be. Uh. W- weirdly enough, 400 Blows was number 41. And then um, Seven Samurai? (laughs) Seven Samurai was number 50. That's a crime. (sighs) But uh, I just, as I'm recollecting all the movies we've talked about, Alien was number 33. So this is not the highest we've gone. That's really insane, though, that it made all the way up to number 40. This was in 2008. for a lot of reasons. It's, yeah, for for a whole lot of reasons. It was 2008, 12 years ago. So maybe they were just, maybe they were thinking differently. It was... Uh, we don't have time to get into it, but the list was sort of constructed in a weird way that maybe I'll get into one day. Um, regardless, that was it. And I watched it and I was like, oh, wow, that was really good. That was really funny. I had not, I had not really dove into that era of cinema extensively until that point. Uh, so I was, I was really taken by it. Um, and of course I was like 16 years old or whatever. I would give anything five stars and it was my first review. I'm like, screw it. Five stars. Uh, and then and then almost five years passed and then it won the extra milestone poll it's crazy how time flies isn't it um and i watched it about a week ago and the world was kind of in the process of going to hell it's in hell right now but at the time it was yeah it was hello not quite welcome there to hell everybody how you doing <laughs> water at the time it was at the time it was not quite there yet and i was just not i was just dramatically not focused on the movie i'm like we can't do this i had not i was not in that so uh we were going to do this episode a couple of times so did a little peek behind the curtain this is we are finally getting to it um and so i watched it i started watching it again a few days ago and then the world kind of went to hell again more personally on a personal basis this time i'm like oh jesus again and then here we are a few days later. I'm finally getting my bearings together. Uh, I don't mean to be so personal, but this is just what's going on. Uh, I finished it, and here we are. Like let, like not even an hour and a half ago, I was still watching the movie. So this is a, this is going to be very fresh reaction to it. Uh, and I watched it on the Criterion Channel, which is the the greatest goddamn streaming service there is. So uh, so now that film know where to gone. go. Yeah, well, it, it it's essentially Filmstruck. It's Filmstruck 2.0. Actually, 3.0, because mm. Hulu was kind of the initial thing. That's a tangent. Uh, but regardless, that's that's our history with His Girl Friday. Uh, not nearly as not nearly as far-reaching as some of the other movies we've talked about in the past. But regardless, uh, that's that's where we're coming from going into it. Now it's at this point where we're going to start getting into the movie itself, the nitty-gritty details of what's going on so if you haven't seen the movie and you're and you don't want to be and you don't want to have the entire plot or our sort of uh, analyses or thoughts on it revealed now is the time to to uh to pause the show and watch it by whatever means you choose uh and 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 hopefully come back we'll still be here so don't you worry now is the time gentlemen what say we get into his girl friday proper Mm -hmm. sure i like we have no other choice we have no other choice. Uh, so His Girl Friday um, starts out with uh, with what you two kind of alluded to earlier. Starts with this title card saying mm-hmm. something like, this is a story about, and I'm paraphrasing here, obviously. This is a story about the dark ages of the newspaper business where reporters, and I, and I love this quote, I love this sentiment, would commit anything short of murder to get that scoop. Like nine out of the ten commandments are breakable in a reporter's eye, but that's the one where they draw the line. Like, it, like I don't it's know, really... Sam. Do they ever take the Lord's name in vain? I don't believe so, don't but they so. couldn't have because of the production code. Uh, the the mm-hmm. implication is that it's a very competitive business, which you do see later on in the movie. Uh, it's a very frantic, it's a very fast business, just by the very nature of it. You got to be on top of everything twenty four seven. And this is but we don't this, really this is see nineteen forty. News... Sorry, sorry. What's that? I said we don't really see newspapers competing against each other. Like uh, we see not, them competing the against themselves. like the mayor. Yeah. Well, I, I'm I'm alluding to the ending where we kind of see multiple reporters from uh, what we what we assume to be multiple different publications, all sort of like saying different things. Like you remember that at the very end. Uh, when, yeah, yeah. They're all they all got of, a different story. 
they all have a different testimony. So that's kind of the idea. But there's also this very like we're kind of in this together feel to it. Um, yeah, we're all in this to bear false witness. That's correct. Yes. See, the commandment thing was not off base. They um, do they give false testimony against their neighbor? I don't remember that. Yeah, they keep uh, saying things that aren't true. That is true. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. Depends how you define they, neighbor. That's why I fake covet, news. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. why fake news rocket <laughs> yeah. i love it uh, well, cookie rocket is cookie rocket. not yes cookie rocket i love it <laughs> oh, little little random planet of the apes <laughs> reference uh regardless uh yeah that's kind of the deal it says this is the world we're living in uh it's a very heightened reality which you find out immediately just given like the pace of the of the dialogue and the broad, you know, plot uh, developments that take place. What happens is that we're introduced to uh, to Hildy Johnson, who is about to be married to this really just kind of affable guy, Bruce Baldwin. Like nothing really, nothing, no real distinct personality trait besides kind of a mild mannered temperament about him. You find out they're about to be married, and and Hildy goes into the newspaper office where she worked before, and. Where her ex-husband Walter Burns, played by Cary Grant, uh, is the editor, kind of the kind of the the fast talking, just anything goes, but as long as it's my way, editor. Uh, who, when we first meet him, is like is like giving himself a shave, which I think is just such a distinct such a distinct image to introduce this character on. Um, she says to him, "I'm leaving, Walter, and and I'm and I'm taking my fiance with me. I'm going to get married." And he says, "Oh, that can't happen. That won't that won't do. I need to do everything in my power to stop this from happening." And sure enough, what follows is just a whole lot of shenanigans. Uh, shenanigans, you say? Shenan? Yes, very many shenanigans. Uh, uh, and and. Uh, Lots of lots of weirdly illegal activity, lots of lots of suspicious behavior, uh, just doing anything to to uh, for Walter to stop Hildy from leaving and getting married uh, and everyone else doing everything in their power to just sort of make everything OK again. Because what what ends up happening is that there is a there is a convicted killer on death row, Earl Williams, uh, who who had shot and killed a police officer. Um and uh, what we find out is that that police officer was uh, was black. And so instead of just putting him in jail, the uh, the governor decides to put him to death um, in order to get and I and this is unsavory speech and I apologize, but in order to get the quote colored vote. Uh, so right off the bat, there's a lot of 1940s in this movie that uh, that's kind of hard to get past at first um and uh it just kind of goes from there and i'm sure we'll talk about the the main plot of that movie but that's kind of that's kind of the stage that's set is that it's this it's this uh uh exciting raucous kind of kind of dramatic but doesn't really like doesn't really get the heart pounding it's just sort of exciting um uh series of events that takes place and leads to a really uh, unusual ending that we'll get to. Now it's at this point where we sort of have to, we sort of have to get just right down to it, gentlemen. And we'll start with John because you've alluded to this before. Having having the the two of you having seen it for the first time, what did you think of this movie, His Girl Friday? Oh, do we have to start with me? I'm kind of the yes, negative we do. one. Yes, we no. It's by all means. Well, you know, look, I appreciate this film. It is obviously well made. It obviously has incredible performances from Rosalind Russell and Cary Grants and a lot of great comic performances. It's got good timing. The dialogue is very zippy. I appreciate the editing. I really appreciate how characters are able to talk over each other, but you still understand what they're saying. Like all that really works. The thing I don't like about this film is that I just don't think it's very engrossing, personally. I yeah. I just think everything it takes you through is very haphazard and sloppy and a lot of the the plot mechanics it's just it's just so surreal and bizarre that like the central tug and pull the cat and mouse game keeps getting overshadowed by this really in my opinion boring story about a murderer who 
the script doesn't know what to do with. I, I, I just think there's yeah. a lot of like finagling to keep him in the movie Earl Williams. And he's one of the most boring characters. And uh-huh. I don't know. I just thought the most entertaining characters are like the only thing about it that are actually entertaining. And so it's kind of just a half and half kind of film for me. And yeah. I, I honestly, I get why people at the time would have really enjoyed this. It's, it obviously is doing a lot of things for its time that are very unusual and very innovative. It's obviously like one of the prototypical screwball films. And I don't mean screwball in any sort of negative way. I think sometimes people are like, screwball, who are you calling screwy? No, it's like. <laughs> it, see, it, I don't see it as a screwball being used in that sense. I feel like if anything, screwball gets used like too often or too liberally as far as like, like I'll hear like a movie be scri- described as screwball and it's like, that's not screwball. That's just. Like it's a little goofy, but it's not screwball. But this sorry, is screwball, I, though. Well, this fault. This is a screwball. Comic, okay, sure. I thought. I'm yeah. sorry. I thought you were saying. Okay, I thought you were saying like no. Oh, I mean, this like one's, you know, overused. No, yeah. but I mean, like something like uh, I. I mean, not that I've heard anyone describe it this way, but like something like I've heard. If I heard like say someone's like, oh, hot rod, that's a screwball. <laughs> like I don't, what? <laughs> like I don't really see that as like a screwball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Co- like it's it's kind of goofy, but it's not like screwball. Yeah. Like, I agree. but like something like say. um like oh brother where art thou like and Cassie's like a screwball comedy yeah or a lot of Coen Brothers movies actually I think are basically screwball comedies yeah uh, not unintentionally yeah. Yeah. interesting so, yeah. for for those who don't know uh, the the general definition the broad definition of a screwball comedy is that whatever John uh, and Will say it is <laughs> <laughs> that's is, what it is, says on dictionary.com. On dictionary.com. Oh, the basic surprising. idea the basic idea is that one or more male characters specifically are really sort of just like not intelligent. Like they don't really have a grasp on what to do or how to do it, but things end up kind of working out for them anyway. Uh oh, wait, at the, that's that sounds like hot rod. Right? <laughs> <laughs> even Sorry, well. even at the expense, mm-hmm. even at the expense of a typically in air quotes, stronger female character. So I think his girl Friday most certainly applies to that. Um, even though it kind of, kind of ends up shooting itself in the foot, uh, by the end. Um, but yeah, that is kind of the deal. Now, John, I'm curious, uh, that, that sort of sloppiness that you talk about, um, I think I can probably assume the answer to this, but do you think that was as a result of the changes that were made? Like, do, like I do. does it, does it compare to the other adaptations that you've seen of the front page? Is this is it unique yeah. to this one? I think there's a clear tension between Howard Hawks and Charles Leder- Lederer, as you hmm. as you would call him, because there, there's a big confusion over what this movie really is. Like you, even if you look at the poster, like I'm looking at the poster right now, and the poster is nothing what this movie is. It's like a big superimposed Cary Grant leerily leerily staring at Rosalind Russell who is not wearing the masculine power suit she wears throughout the film she's wearing a dress and it's Mm. like that's not this movie the tagline is she learned about men from him it's like that's not this movie at all this movie (laughs) I mean you could say that's more sexism from the marketing standpoint though I do I yeah well I'm bringing it up because I think it's it's emblematic of the confusion in the film itself too and okay. I think that at times it kind of works because I do, the th- again, the thing I like about the, what I think Hawks was going for was the idea of like this woman who she wants to be a housewife, but she, she doesn't want to, she doesn't really want to be subservient. Hence the title of the film is supposed to be ironic of like his girl Friday, uh, Friday is supposed to be like in reference to somebody who is subservient but that's clearly not who she is. And so the film is about rising above who you, th- you're, who you think you're supposed to be or what society dictates you to be. But throughout the movie, I just think that it, it keeps forgetting that the, the way that she, she tries to sell herself as like, I want to be treated like a woman. Like none of it really works. I'm like, why? Like you never act like that's what you really want. And I don't know. There's something about that that didn't quite land for me, I guess. Interesting. I, I'm curious to hear more about this. But first, I want to ask, Will... This is your first time viewing it, as you mentioned before. Tell yeah. me, what was your reaction to His Girl Friday? Was it similar to John's, or was it a little was it a little uh, askew from that? Uh, I mean, I would say we do agree on certain aspects of it. I think I do like it more overall, though, and I think it just comes from the perspective from which I'm seeing it, which is that I think I get where he's coming from, and I can see the broader overview of how that is kind of demoralizing as far as how Hildy's character. But I guess I'm seeing it more from like 
not so much Hildy representing like womanhood so much as like just as a central character, like seeing in the beginning, which I think for like the first, like I'd say 15, maybe 20 minutes, I was really, really digging this movie. Like, especially like, like you guys were saying the zippiness, the like, kind of like it like emulates like a typewriter as like they're talking, just like this, like kind of clicky clack huh. dialogue that just like, you know, just the pacing of it's just like, even just like if you close your eyes and listen to it, it has like this rhythm to it that I really enjoy. And I think the performances, from Cary Grant and uh, remind me the the actress's name. I'm blanking on hers right now. Rosalind Russell. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So I thought they were fantastic, especially her. I mean, I thought that was a great performance from her. Although I think Cary Grant tends to get the lion chair or the praise here. I think it's really her that makes it work. Um, but where I do agree with John is that like, I think after like this first act, like after like the 30 minute mark, the movie really just slows to a halt with this murder or subplot, <laughs> which is not even bad. It's just that it feels like a kind of different film at this point. Like it's yeah. kind of like comes in exactly. kind of like this kind of gets crowbarred into this film in a way that feels very abrupt and then it just kind of gets the film in like a lull period for about like another 30 or so minutes and then it picks up again towards the end although it just doesn't have that quite that same magic that i think the first like 20 30 minutes like i said had so i think overall it, i think it's a good film like i think it works i think it's really the two performances that carry it as well as just having howard hawks who clearly is like it really good at directing this type of comedy on board and i think a lot of the writing carries it but i just think the pacing is what kind of holds it back more than not and obviously we can say that's a scripting issue as well but i think it's just more that like we have such a solid beginning that becomes it's like blessing its curse like it's like a really great start to this movie really gets you hooked in then it just kind of leaves you hanging for a sizable portion in a way that i don't think quite fully gets redeemed by the end but Hmm. uh i still enjoyed it by and large very interesting yeah, it's 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 uh that that's fascinating what you say about how the first 30 minutes feels like kind of a different movie than the last hour because it's a deadly that's exactly what it is. Like the the initial play was just the whole murderer thing. Like uh mm. it it's very apparent once you know it and especially once you've seen the first 30 minutes of this movie like three or four times like I have just because of the circumstances. Um you start to realize like yeah, these the scene in the newspaper office and this quick scene in the restaurant right after that feel like definitely feel like they were tacked on to the beginning of something else um and 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 even if you watch rewatch like that very first interaction between hildy and walter um like they they I, I think it's not even longer than 10 seconds they give this really quick establishment like yeah there's also this thing going on with a murderer like that's like it, it gets one line of dialogue at the beginning and then it it ends up becoming the main plot of the movie i almost wish they had just sort of written that initial like 30 or so minutes and then just kind of spun off from there and like not really and just decided to not really focus on um the the uh, murder thing because frankly it's i can see why i can see how it would work on its own just this kind of silly uh like let's get through this situation today like just another day in the newspaper office another fictional exaggerated day granted that would that seems like it would have been more interesting if they had gone one way or the other uh a la the other adaptations of the front page as i've come to understand you guys want another theory? Time for another theory. Everybody get them around to the John. old the old theory radio yes. broadcast. Um six feet apart though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> here's here's what I gotta say about yep. that. I think he I think he considered it. I think Howard Hawks knew he had something good here. And I think he thought while they were filming that maybe they were gonna try to lean in a little bit more into the subject matter of this relationship but i think he noticeably deci- noticeably decided to keep them separated for a lot of it because i think he realized they don't have a lot of chemistry you don't think so i don't think so yeah, i, I gotta think, disagree with you man. i think the dynamic between them is he's all over her constantly and she's constantly rejecting him and she doesn't seem she seems more interested in the newspaper business and her career. There's chemistry in that than there is these personalities. Like I think the way these personalities clash is not very electric. And huh. that's my that's that's John's I guess it's more of a hot take than a theory. It sounds like it. Sure. Okay, that'll do it for me this week. <laughs> you guys have fun. <laughs> It's, I don't know. I think I think I have to disagree because I think the performance is really there's like some there's a sizzle. The performances are good. I really feel no, but I think that's where the chemistry comes from. Like I can see mm-hmm. from a writing standpoint, there is like this tug that's inherent to it. But like in that opening moment, like the way they complement each other, especially contrasting her soon to be husband, who is like not really a dumb guy, but he's kind of like it's a little more like slow going, like kind of like 
more even kilter and he just kind of like in in like you know he's a good guy like he means he's like this he's just like a entirely kind of like average kind of dude in a way that like obviously it's not that she's using him but she just sees him more for like the prospects of what he's going to be which is like a stable reliable husband more than she's really endeared or uh warmed up to his personality and i think that's where i see the movie not so much like like for her it's just like they just click so much her and Cary Grant because like it just they have the similar personality. It's like they have this initial resistance where they like don't really see eye to eye. Like obviously like see? Cary Grant's very aggressive, but like they do mm-hmm. have this spark where it's like they do like as much as they like kind of nag each other, they they connect in a way that like she just can't with this other guy as much as she wants to. I what can't say I can't agree. I, I honestly I think it's it feels platonic to me, honestly. Like it feels like what they have is just sort of like a bickering siblings. And like one of the reasons I I catch that instead of how you're catching it is because like it, it's part of the movie that they they don't really have a lot of romantic tension. Like every time he tries to touch her, well, professional, she John. pushes him off. And well, that's the thing is like they never they never kind of look into each other's eyes. There's never there's not much romance to it. So I just never bought it. I mean, I am a slave of the trappings of cinema, and cinema has taught me over the years there are certain cues to like oh these characters they want to get busy. And that's not here. I just see two people, <laughs> two arguing well, co-workers who want to be codependent on each other. It's because they have baggage. Like, they've been married before. They know, like, they're not good for one another. But there is that kind of, like, pool where they have that connection, I think. That's where it's like, if this was them, like, meeting for the first time, and it's like, we need to believe that, like, these two are going to fall in love later, then sure, I could get that. But it's more like... She had a thing with this guy. It didn't go well. She wants to leave. She wants to be with the stable, reliable person. But there is that pool where it's like they, she does connect with this dude. I don't she know. doesn't want to. I don't know, Will Ashton. Haven't you ever been in the same room as an ex? And it's like, oh, man, we've been talking for hours. What is this? What is this spark out of nowhere? <laughs> well, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm kind of alluding to here is that. I think it's like that thing where it's like they they do have that spark. For, I mean, maybe it's just a difference of how I, that, we yeah, the film just, or how we see it. I think it's subjective uh, at this point. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I see it. I mean, I, I, I feel like there's a spark between them. And maybe it's because like of the code that they can't really fully embrace it. But I, I, I think it's there. I don't know. Because I think they can imply it through dialogue a little bit better. There can be because, I mean, we look back at it happened one night. What happened that night? We don't know. Mm-hmm. Even still, Sam, which of us is right? Uh, weirdly enough, I've been waiting to interject because this is very fascinating to me. I think you're both right, but I think my take right uh, I don't, Both sizing don't, it once again. Don't sigh at me, John. Uh, John, I think, I think, uh, what you say about them not having that sort of lover's chemistry is, is actually quite correct. And I think I, I don't want to say that's intentional, but I think here, here's the, here's the thing. And it kind of ties into my, greater overarching thoughts about this movie um if if you haven't guessed uh my sort of my reaction to it having gone back to it the second time is that uh it, it's fine like i think i'm i'm a little bit closer to will probably but i'm somewhere i'm definitely not in that loving it range which makes it very interesting this is the first milestone we've done where where none of us are really enamored by it uh, yeah none of us are that if, jazzed by this movie we if, should have if done if all I'm that not jazz. mistaken that was last month, John, but uh, maybe Sorry. maybe another time. Um, <laughs> I couldn't help it. I know you couldn't, and I and I admire you for that. Uh, I think there is, as I mentioned before, there's a lot sort of simmering under the surface of this movie. I and I wonder how much the filmmakers all a, across the board, uh, directors, writers, performers, what have you. I wonder how much they were in on it because. Uh, I think it is actually kind of a deeply cynical movie, especially within the genre of the screwball comedy, which is sort of designed to just exploit male, uh, 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 what's the word? Not, not necessarily naivete, but just sort of the, the broad life outlook that certain men have. I don't want to generalize, but that's ignorance. Kind of, uh, maybe so. Yeah. Uh, ignorance or just sort of short sightedness. Uh, yeah, that's probably closer to it. Just sort of insular. We're just gonna keep naming thinking. like negative things about our own gender for the next hour. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> idiocy of which, which clumsy, <laughs> For- <laughs> forgetful. Uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a movie that at first 
it's looking like it's gonna, it's going to have this really interesting sort of path that it's going to go down because we, we uh hildian uh, uh walter they reunite and hildy's just having none of walter's nonsense which it is i think i think cary grant is very knowingly playing just kind of a just kind of a doofy guy like a lot of his plans are not really that smart uh you can see why he sort of makes a better like you know, CEO than anything, because he certainly has charisma. It's Cary Grant, of course. It would be, yeah. it would be hard for him not well, he's to. he's got confidence. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. <laughs> he's got confidence, if not, if, if, even if he can't necessarily put his money where his mouth is. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me, um, I don't know if you've seen, I know John has, I've been watching Nathan for you in the midst of quarantining. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in the first episode, he, he like does this experiment where like he'll just basically get like uh, a child to do like a, like he'll say anything that the seven-year-old wants him to and it's like just relying solely on the confidence to see huh. if he can get the job <laughs> that's just what i'm thinking of right now so yeah i i haven't seen that episode in particular but i do okay. know i do i am familiar with the show so yeah i think it's yeah. it's definitely that same thing um and it's looking like hildy's gonna kind of end up sort of outsmarting walter like there's this whole scheme with like a life insurance policy uh that ends up going down it's looking like she's gonna get the better of him uh and what is it with these movies and like life insurance policies I, i'm sorry i'm gonna get on a tangent but that seems to be like a reoccurring trend when these things i mean it's, maybe that's it's, just me it's an easy well for drama it's a whole lot of money death is involved right i don't know it just seems like i've seen that a lot in a lot of like old-fashioned movies yeah just, and, and what is it know. what is it with airline food anyway what's the deal yeah it used to be free <laughs> yeah the, well, that famous that insurance. famous jerry seinfeld bit life insurance policies in the 1940s it does come up kind of a disproportional amount of times i can't imagine that this was this was accurate to the time like there wasn't life insurance schemes going on all the time but who knows none of us were alive at the time for all we know so uh maybe we're maybe we're wrong who knows uh but regardless uh what i was getting at is that it looks like it's looking like hildy's gonna get the better of walter but what slowly ends up happening and it's actually really insidious if you watch the movie is that uh and i think part of this comes from the fact that i'm unclear about whether or not hildy actually wants to start a family life or if that's what's sort of been indoct uh, indoctrinated into her by quote the system like is she genuine in her desire to go off and get married and uh start See, yeah a family that's what bothers me it's like i don't think the movie ever proves that out or gives yeah. you any real indication as to like why is she do like what changed her was it the marriage like is the divorce what made her real oh i want stability you know like i they could it could have been a little bit more elegant in that storytelling because then i i don't know what she really wants and then i stop caring yeah and to the point where if when that's left sort of up in the air her actual like you know her uh her genuine emotions um when you watch the ending of that movie it's all about walter convincing her to not only stay uh, to not only not get married, to not only stay in the journalism business, but to get back together with him. Like, it's a really kind of unsavory ending, no matter how you look at it. And they make a joke about like, oh, I wonder if like we're going to go uh, uh, we're going to get married in Albany, which happens to be where uh, they were going to get married initially, Bruce and uh, Hildy. And Walter says, I wonder if Bruce can put us up while we're there. Like, it's meant to be this funny line, but really, Bruce kind of kind of like the whole world turns on him in a day. And, yeah. and this movie takes place in not quite real time, but it's pretty close. It's all over the course of a day it's it's troubling to see uh just how the entire movie is seemingly constructed around this guy walter who by the the nature of the genre the screwball comedy as we mentioned before is sort of meant to get some sort of comeuppance by the end uh, it, would, it would have been so easy to to write something in to make some sense out of her her change of heart uh, especially yeah. like there's a whole scene where she's sitting with earl williams and she's interviewing him and you have this great opportunity there to contrast the relationship between him and what's her name molly and you know to contrast that relationship with her relationship with one of the two men and for her to be going through that thinking process of like what's different about these men what what am i attracted to to these two men and why and like you could easily yeah. have had dialogue it's time for another round of john rewrites a classic film and even though nobody <laughs> asked him to sure have at it yeah 
That that's a very interesting idea. I my idea because I thought about this is um it's based on a Broadway play, so therefore it comes across as very objective. We're not. It's not that we're not getting to know these characters in particular. It's more that we're just sort of watching them navigate their way through their through uh through the plot. My idea fixate on one character, uh, and it could be any of the three main characters, but preferably focus on Hildy. What's going on inside of her man in inside of her head? Or, and this would be possibly even more interesting, what, how does Bruce feel about all this? He sort of disappears from the Ah, movie eventually. He gets arrested. No, I care. He gets arrested multiple times at the expense of Hildy and Walter's uh, shenanigans Mm -hmm. and all the stuff that's going on with the murder. Mostly Walter. I'd say mostly Walter granted, but, but Hildy yeah. also there, there's a couple times when she doesn't seem especially, uh, you know, you know, taken, uh, taken down about having, about getting her husband arrested, even though it's by accident, she sort of just uses like this matter of fact thing, like, all right, well, I guess we got to go bail him out. Like this is clearly meant to be sort of, they're meant to be sort of flippant about just how seemingly insane all of this is like, if this actually happened in real life, and obviously this is very elevated, if these events actually took place, it would be really ludicrous like it would be it would make the national headlines and so they're meant to sort of treat it like it's nothing and that could work just fine like there's no problem with that but because we're not really getting to know about how any of these characters feel about it uh it just it just comes across as i don't want to say cold but kind of unknowable in a way that i was not anticipating and i think uh yeah go for it no no i was just gonna say that like i think this kind of goes to my point which is that like for Hildy, it's just that idea of like stability and like knowing yeah. that this guy, like that she is, she doesn't really like the person. I mean, I think she likes him fine, but I don't think she loves the person so much. She loves the you're idea of about, like what he's talking about Bruce. Yeah. Like what he represents, which okay. is like stability, wife, like being like a, a, a husband with kids and you know having some sense of normalcy in her life as opposed to the kind of rat tat sure uh over the top mindset of being like a journalist in like a very inconsistent profession and so like him in jail was just like oh okay like he's fine he's just there i can deal with him later it's just like it's (laughs) cold but i think it kind of adds to this idea of like if she really did love this guy like i think she would be more concerned like she'd be like going after walter and she's like a little annoyed to be clear but like i think it just kind of adds the point where she's like it makes sense what happens later in the film because like those scenes happen and her response is telling in that respect. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting. You say that. I what think I've, I think I figured out why I don't like this movie as much. Lay it on us. It just dawned on me. So, you know, the old adage that uh, a movie takes you through the most important week of a character's life, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. This is not the most important week of Hildy's life. It's not. <laughs> no, I want the sequel. This girl is Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> and in that movie, yeah, no, Walter's gone. He's not in it. Sorry, Walt bye. Bruce yeah. Baldwin, never heard of him. He's okay. he got forgotten. Her because... man Saturday. <laughs> Her what? Her man Saturday, wouldn't that be the sequel? His man Saturday. He said Her his Man girl... Saturday. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah, Her Man Saturday. Right. There's only one other character in the sequel, and that's uh Joe Pettibone. <laughs> the guy who can't accept the bride yeah. bribe uh-huh. mm-hmm. yeah so it's like those two oh, he, road trip they're yeah. gonna solve a supernatural murder it's oh, gonna be like goodness. knives out okay. meets scooby-doo i'm I, writing I, it who's in i knew when you said i figured out why i don't like this movie i'm like this is either gonna be genuinely insightful or a dumb joke mm-hmm. and it turned okay, out it's being both a little both yeah <laughs> That's what I'm I mean, just saying. I feel like I mean I just want to say about that character though before uh, we move on to different topics. I like and I don't that he's in this movie only since like I think he's a very funny character. I think the dialogue they give him and the performance that he gives is funny, but he also feels like he Wait, who, literally Joe walked Pet- in from a totally... Billy Billy Gilbert or yeah. Um, okay, okay. With, like, sorry, I was like, making sure that's what you're talking about. He just seems like yeah. a character that's like completely from a separate film. <laughs> That just kind of wandered in and he's like so very clueless about everything in a way that's like (laughs) kind of over the top. And I know everything about this movie is over the top, but it feels like a different sort of over the top. Like kind of like Mm. like if he I feel like he would fit more in like the in our aforementioned like Marx Brothers discussion. Like he'd be like a character Mm. in that kind of film. Yeah. And this he just kind of like just kind of randomly walks in is completely oblivious to everything in a way that I find very amusing, but just seems kind of off kilter from what the rest of the movie's like. And yeah, it's like my presence on extra milestone a little bit. (laughs) Oh man. Don't, 
Don't sell yourself short, John. Uh, I just like show up and I'm like, wait, this is entertaining, but what, what, what podcast does this guy think he's on? Oh, who yeah. knows? Uh, yeah, that's uh, it. It's kind of it's a real mixed bag of a movie. I think that's kind of the conclusion that we're all ending up at is that because here's the thing. When I first when I watched it that first time, however many years ago, I guess it would be almost five years ago. Uh, I was not I was not look, I was not reading into it. I was not reading into the characters. And I think I don't think it's meant to be written into. I know that's kind of its own can of worms, but mm-hmm. I think it's just sort of it, its heart is in the right place. It just wants to be kind of a uh, kind of a kind of an exciting comedy um that just so happens to have just a slight undercurrent of all this other stuff that we've been mentioning. But if you really look into it, it becomes real obvious that maybe it's not that they didn't know what they were doing, it's that they didn't know uh they didn't know how to do it, but they thought they did. To the point where I would really I would really be fascinated to see this exact story, you know, in inconsistent plot and all. What would it look like today? How would what like through a through a modern viewpoint, what would this be like? How would this well, be, how would this play differently? Directed by Paul Feig. Uh, <laughs> don't be say don't gender, threaten me. Gender no. reversed again, so Melissa McCarthy yeah. would be the uh Cary Grant. <laughs> character <laughs> yeah and like zach woods uh, would be hildy <laughs> no it'd be lucas hedges oh there you go yeah, yeah. That, would, that would be you know what i pay to see it actually it, no it, it is a comedy so i guess it would have to be like jason statham there you go yeah. jason statham that would be so weird uh, i i do want to say that we we're sitting around and we're we're I'm criticizing <laughs> we're throwing all these problems but quentin tarantino considers this one of his favorite movies of all time that yeah. makes sense um, up there with, uh, yeah, cause he, let's see, he did the director's poll for the BFI. I have it in front of me. He voted for Apocalypse Now, The Bad News okay. Bears, the 76 version, Carrie, sure. Days and Confused, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, Great Escape, His Girl Friday, Jaws, Pretty Maids All in a Row, Rolling Thunder, Sorcerer, and Taxi Driver. So huh. there you go. List. Yeah. All right. It's like, no, you do not understand what is going on just beneath the surface of His Girl Friday. It is mind-blowing to the point where i don't think anyone else can understand it because they're not at the level that i am sorry i think i, to, I think the I level that he's at Tarantino impression. i think i think he really appreciates movies where the uh the male boss uh his girlfriend or ex is one of his employees so um, yeah now that's a can there of worms we go. Yeah. who did you mention earlier harry Cohn? anyway yeah the the devil himself quentin Tarantino, the harvey weinstein harry of the Cohn. 40s yeah. i did uh, not want to say it but yes yeah. that's essentially what i was getting at um oh, man. a lot of cans of worms are being opened right now <laughs> yeah, gentlemen. i'm just like knocking them knocking yeah. them back <laughs> oh god there's worms all over the floor john why, why are you pushing all them down your gullet Ew, oh gosh, man. this is this this conversation has flown off the rails, gentlemen. I think we've sort of I think we've sort of laid out where we're where we're at on this movie. Is there anything that we have not gotten to yet that we want to that we want to make sure we get to say over the airwaves? I mean, I think I'm mostly in agreement with you. I think it does work better than I think yeah. you might give it credit, but I do think the only thing I would push back against in your last statement is that I think they knew what movie they're making. I don't think they made it perfectly, but I think they knew what they're making. I just think it's a product of its time. And sure. that I think its mindset is just of a film that's from 80 years ago and that the gender politics are of that time and that we've just kind of grown and adapted in that way. But I don't I don't think it's to say that yeah. like they they didn't know what they were doing. I mean, maybe they didn't. I don't know. But um, I don't, that was my read of it more is that like I just think it's a product of its time more than it's them sure. not 100 percent knowing what they're trying to say and what they're doing with it. But that's my only pushback against yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. We, we can only get so mad at it, but there's still no reason that we can't look back and say, hey, here's what doesn't necessarily work nearly a century later. I, I think that's fair. Um, I'd say and, I'm not even mad at it. Yeah. I'm just disappointed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. John, what are what are your what's what's sum it up? What yeah, is I mean, what is John's view of his girlfriend? Yeah, I would say it's uh, hmm. I would end on a positive note and say that I do think it is an effective movie by the time you get to the end. This the, the annoying thing is that I think the execution makes wide chunks of this film, as we brought up, in, mostly in the second and third act, a bit of a slog. And yeah. I, I just, yeah, I maintain a lot of what I said, but I will I will concede that I do think the ending, the uh, the circular closure of the ending is pretty effective in that it, it really does sort of tell the story of like some people never change. And when you get back into this the tumultuous love story like that is more exciting 
than it is maybe satisfying long term. People aren't really going to, they're always going to come back and, you know, they're always going to be that person again. Uh, The way the film ends with how just as soon as he's gotten the girl back, he goes right back to his old ways and is like, ah, instead of, you know, Niagara Falls, we'll go to Albany and like disappointing her all over again. Mm -hmm. And it's like in that moment, she realizes like, oh, this, this same story is going to happen again. And that really, honestly, that's what brings me back to like, this isn't the most important week of this person's life. She's way too fascinating for the most important thing of her life to be this toxic circle she's trapped in with this really annoying person. And so that's yeah. that's why I have a grudge a little bit with the movie is that I think that it lets down what is actually a pretty well-written character, probably for the ghost writing reasons that were brought up earlier. And yeah, I just think that it's a, it's an okay film. It's, a, it's, it's obviously not bad. And I think a lot of people are going to enjoy it, especially if you love classic film. But I uh, can't say that it is a favorite milestone for me. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm I'm very much in the same boat. I think it's um, I I just I I want to make this clear because I don't know if I've emphasized this quite enough yet. Uh, it still works. Like, like just in the dictionary definition of it, mm-hmm. it is a movie. You can watch it. Like there's an arc that the characters go through. You can Things get through happen. it just fine. Yeah, there's lots of incident. You can get through it you just can press fine. Press play. <laughs> yeah. And and you can watch the thing and then it'll be over and you will have watched the movie. It's it's as simple as that. Mm-hmm. No, I think it's yeah. it's you could certainly watch, you can certainly get something out of it, but I think there's it's just hard to deny all the all the weird stuff going on. Like like it's right there. So it's impossible if, if you're looking even just a little bit, not to see that questionable stuff. But I will end up coming down on it. I do think the the humor is mostly effective, which is impressive. I think I, we didn't really focus too specifically on the jokes, but I think there are a lot of very funny ones. We could quote some of them if we had more time. But alas, we do not. I think that I think that just about sums up our discussion on His Girl Friday. A good one, I thought. I'm glad that I'm I'm glad that we finally got a movie that we were more critical of. Uh, we've had movies in the past. Just last month, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, where John was not as high on Young Frankenstein as I was i'm glad that we found one that we could all agree has some improvements to be yeah, made yeah but i don't like this trend yeah so, well listeners John, this is the part where you help us make that not happen this is the part where you help us because it is that time of the show and and we got to fly through this a little bit faster than we normally do but this is the part where we announce what we might talk about next month i was surprised to find out there were a lot of really good contenders. And there were a few that I removed from the poll that I'm really sad that I had to. And I would and have... And this is for... If- yeah, this is for February. This will this will be for the month of February. We uh, like this one. We're gonna try to get it out sooner rather than later, within a couple of weeks or so, because God knows we'll have a lot of free time on our hands. Here mm-hmm. is what is on the docket, going in order of release date. First up, we have turning one hundred years old. The iconic, the influential, the cabinet of Doctor Caligari. Gentlemen, have you seen this silent mm-hmm. picture? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've seen it. It's it's a it, it's it's a fascinating one, isn't it? Um, it was mm-hmm. innovated a lot of a lot of uh, technological uh, innovations or that sentence. You you know what I mean? It did a lot of stuff, mm-hmm. uh, made a lot of movements in the yeah, technical did. world, <laughs> and uh, and has a lot of really indelible imagery that in that inspired a lot of filmmakers. Not the least of them was Tim Burton. Uh, yeah. A lot mm-hmm. of Tim Burton's imagery comes from this movie. Uh, if you haven't, some seen of my it, favorite posters of all time. The posters are really mm-hmm. good. If you haven't seen the movie, you will recognize the screenshots. At the very least, the style of the movie. Was yeah, very look at look at any film by Robert Wine, and you'll see it's like yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's really visually indelible, if nothing else. Uh, jumping ahead twenty years. Uh, I think this might be, I, I can't remember if we've had an animated movie on the poll before. Um, but this will be, if this wins, have. it'll be, it'll be the first one to win. We, yeah. Probably in the past. At least on the once. poll. Yeah. Iron Giant, in, I think was one of them. Oh yeah. That's yeah, right. That's I right. forgot about that. Uh, but if this Avatar? wins, it'll end up being the first one. Avatar. Yeah. <laughs> Pinocchio was released in February of 1940. Ooh. Another indelible classic. Oh, that'd be good. That yeah. I have not seen. <laughs> yeah. Weirdly enough. <laughs> you haven't seen Pinocchio. I have what? not seen Pinocchio. I started oh, it a long that's... time ago. I never finished it. I wonder if it's on oh, Disney well. Plus. I'm gonna look. I, there, it I, is on Disney Plus. There's no reason for it not to be. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's on. Disney oh, it Plus. is on Disney. It was one of the first things I saw on Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it heard you, John. The computer Oops. heard you. Yep. Um, up next on the poll, jumping ahead another 20 years. Um, and by the way, I should specify, like last month, I will be I'll be publishing a separate article with all these options on them. Where you but can Sam, on what website? On cinemaholics.com, Jonathan. 
Cinemaholics.what? Cinemaholics.com. Start wow. spelling computer, then stop. Don't forget to call your parents before logging on. D- call your parents, yeah. <laughs> just just call your parents <laughs> yeah. in general. By Not all even for permission, just in general. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway. Wait, what uh, website was it again? Cinemaholics.com. I can all, we can only do this for so long, John. Uh, all right. Up next on up next on the poll, and this I, I'll admit, uh, a month ago, this probably wouldn't have made it onto the poll, but I feel like it's somewhat relevant, uh, and I and I happen to really really like it. I think it's quite good. It is uh, starring the late great Max von Sydow, Ingmar mm. Bergman's The Virgin Spring, which was remade by West Craven as The Last House on the Left uh okay it's a really good movie whether or not this ends up winning which it probably won't just given the history of these polls uh seek it out it's really really Hmm. good it's kind of it's it's uh it's not an easy watch per se but it's an effective one as is anything by ingmar bergman uh, on the criterion channel it would be i would love nothing more than to talk about this but it it, yeah speaking speaking of crossing off milestone directors (laughs) that would be yeah that would be that that would be a good one uh, up next, also the year 1960. Now, John, we we talked about this uh, many apartment. months ago. Not the apartment. Uh, uh, that's that's for a, that's a few months from now. Uh, uh, a movie that I have not seen that's very influential. The Godfather uh, Part Two. Not the Godfather <laughs> Part Two. La Dolce Vita. Federico Fl- uh, Fellini's oh, yeah. 1960 three-hour epic. Uh, that I've been meaning to see for years and have not gotten to it yet. John, I know you really love it. Is am I correct in that? Yeah, it it literally is like one of the absolute greatest films of all time. It's it's probably my favorite like undying love story, which only makes sense if you you have to see it. Mm. Um, so that's that's my thing. I know it's not everybody's favorite Fellini, so I guess we'll uh we'll see. It could be a contentious milestone, is what I'm saying. Hmm. Yeah. That would why, be why do you hmm at me, Will Ashton? <laughs> no, I just I, I, a contentious Fellini episode of uh, <laughs> of extra milestone is very intriguing to me. <laughs> it really is. Well, part of it is I think people people bemoan the length a lot, um, so that's why I would assume because people they're would have weak. Issue. Yeah, yeah, and some people think that it's kind of pointless, but that's because oh, yeah. they don't. No, never mind. Fair enough. We will we will potentially right. get to it. Uh, up next, and I'll admit this is there. There's all there's like a virtually a zero percent chance of this winning but i wanted to throw it onto the poll just because it's one of my favorites uh the 1975 sci-fi classic the stepford wives which was a oh, okay. a huge influence oh. on uh jordan peele when he made get out so if that entices you for anything uh it's really it's also uh yeah a big influence on frank oz when he made 2004 it's the stepford wives there you go <laughs> you don't know. i was yeah, gonna I say I was actually like, was influence. yeah that's that's the only one i've seen is the nicole kidman one hmm. Very interesting. Well, the one the one I'm talking about is the one with Catherine Ross from uh, The Graduate. Uh, mm-hmm. It's really, really good. It's really unsettling. It's one of the more effective horror sci-fi movies I've ever seen, if not the most effective. I highly recommend it, uh, even though it probably won't end up winning. Another sci-fi movie that I think, I believe, has some horror elements, and I say that because I also haven't seen this one. It's another really big one that I've not gotten around to yet, uh, and I mentioned this on the show before, Brazil. I've never seen mm-hmm. Brazil. Oh, really? Oh, it's yeah. It's a good movie. Yeah. Oh, uh, man. I will, the music I will. is great. <laughs> I don't know what John's humming. I assume it has Brazil. something to do with the movie. It's the theme song of Brazil. Okay. That, that's what I assumed. Yeah. Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> it's, it's great. Audience, if it's, you want yeah, to get me, if you want to force me to finally, if you want to force me to finally watch Brazil, you know what to do. And our final yeah. nominee yeah. also. I mean, that, it is a dark comedy, so that might, that might yeah. work. Yeah. More comedies. Win, yeah. More comedies. But to bring it to. I mean, the ending's not, the ending's not very funny, but. If yeah. we, if we anyway. end up doing a full, like, year straight of comedy, that would be very interesting. And we might have to, like, nix them off the poll at a certain point. But yeah. for now, it'd be a real on. commentary on 2020. That's for, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Mm, I will do any, we will go to any length to just talk about lightheartedness, uh, and things of that nature. Our final nominee, mm. not un, not dissimilar in terms of tone, at least from what I've heard. Another one I haven't seen. This is a, this is an off month for me. Uh, it's, it's stylistic. I feel like it's Sam Nolan here. Seeing yeah, all yeah. his movies that you haven't seen. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Completely stylistically unsimilar from Brazil, but also from what I understand, a little bit more lighthearted, a little bit more comedic. 
John Hughes, The Breakfast Club. That is the final okay. nominee. <laughs> Wait, you haven't seen Breakfast Club? I've not seen The Breakfast Club. That's right. That's surprising. I've yeah. seen that movie too many times to confess on this podcast. Uh, I mean, that would be a pretty hot button episode. <laughs> hot button? There's some stuff. I mean, there's some stuff in that movie that doesn't age well. Uh, uh, I'll just say it that. Okay. But it, 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 I mean, do you disagree with that? <laughs> no, not necessarily. I, I know okay. it's not. I know it's I didn't not. Say it's a bad film. I think it's I think I remember Will Ashton's yeah, okay. eyes. I didn't even say that. I just said there's a couple. Uh, well, we'll that might win. It's so not we'll politically talk about correct. If we do. That's for sure. Mm, yeah. Well, I mean, I would say it's aged better than some other John Hughes movies. <laughs> yeah, many other least, '80s so. movies in general. Let's be fair. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 very true. Better than Heather's. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I haven't seen Heather's, so I, I can't speak for that one. Oh, well, very that might have to come down the line one of these days. Well, that was that was that was eighty nine, I think, wasn't it, or was it ninety? It was it was somewhere around there. It's for a future. I think it was date. like eighty seven, something like that. Yeah, maybe eighty eight, late eighties, early nineties. Regardless, we will. I'm sure we'll at least mention it eventually. Those are your nominees for the month of February. In air quotes, I'll run the, I'll run them down one more time. The Cabinet of Doctor Caligari. Pinocchio, The Virgin Spring, La Dolce Vita, Stepford Wives, Brazil, and The Breakfast Club. And uh, Heather's. Go to that. Just kidding. And not that's Heather's. N- not Heather's. Sorry. Don't that's 1988. I was wrong. Don't listen. Mm-hmm. Okay. 2023. Here we come. All right. Uh, go to that uh, separate article that will be published uh, very soon, if not immediately after the uh, page for this episode itself, which you just listened to. We hope you all enjoyed. Uh, gentlemen, I had fun speaking with you, as always. Going back in time, talking yeah. about the this art form that we've dedicated our heart and soul to. <laughs> yeah. And uh, sorry, I didn't like the movie as much as my friends. Don't be sorry. <laughs> we're you're we're we're not as we're not as in uh, in much of a disagreement as you think. Uh, mm. I think that's all we got uh, from the Internet Colorado. I'm Sam Nolan from the Internet Pennsylvania. I'm Will Ashley. and from www.cinemaholics. Wait a minute, what is it? Dot, dot com, C O M. Don't forget to call your parents, check in on them, make sure they're doing okay, and ask for permission before logging on. Bye. Uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. <laughs>